Um, good. So, uh, so what art by, by sharing is just what I've, what I've been doing. This is a little bit of a personal story. Um, but I've been spending probably way too much time uh, just streaming, streaming content uh, because it's all available and I'm, and I'm here and I've been, been having this moment. And, and I've been thinking a lot about what we, what we need right now. And uh, it, was, it was funny because the moment when everything, and I'm based, by the way, in uh, Washington, D.C., and the moment when uh, many things started becoming I mean, big events to be canceled. And one of the big events that became canceled was South by Southwest. And I had planned a big talk around trends. And I had a lot of friends who I see maybe once a year. I know like you have your, uh, your gatherings and, and everybody looks forward to that, right? That big moment when everyone comes together. And it's really hard because you don't get that chance. And it was hard for, for a lot of my friends. It was hard for a lot of, for a lot of us to just deal with the idea that something so big that we'd been going to year after year was, was not going to happen anymore. And so I started doing a, a virtual version of what I was going to talk about there. And I started just doing more reading, uh, listening more. Uh, that was my reaction because for, for many years, I've been a listener of stories and I thought, well, this is a good time to start doing more of that because uh, if I can listen a little bit more, maybe I can figure out what's going on and then answer these questions that people are asking about trends and about the future and about how to get ready for it and, and what to do next. And as I was doing that, uh, I came across a video that I'd seen actually a couple of years ago, but I rewatched it. And it was from this uh, film, which some of you might have seen, uh, called The Greatest Showman. And it was one of these videos of the auditions before the movie had been made. And it was with the star, well, one of the stars of the, of the movie and this main song called This Is Me. And in the clip, the director who's sitting next to the star uh, in, this, uh, in this visual was talking about the moment when she first sang the song to the rest of the crew, to everyone. And he's sharing this story about how she was behind the, the music stand. And... Uh, um, and basically when she was behind the music stand, uh, she was really nervous and it was really hard um, to get her to kind of come out uh, from behind there uh, because she was just not feeling it. And there's this moment in the song, you can watch in the video actually, where she seems really nervous and she's standing behind the song and then she kind of comes out from behind the podium and when she finishes singing this first part of the song, she kind of turns around and she looks at the chorus and all of the people who are behind her. And she sort of raises her hand and she says like, just, you know, there's a guy who's about to have a solo and she just raises her hand and she kind of says, Hey, you know, like bring the solo, like do it uh, really in an excited way. And the guy does that, right. He stands up on his chair, he goes crazy and you see him like just, bringing full energy into the entire room and just like taking off. And from that moment, like he's just singing, everybody else jumps in and they start singing. And then like, you see this transformation in the whole song and that energy takes it from like just this one shy person behind the podium, not really sure what to do to something different, like something amazing. And as I watched that, I was thinking like, you know, sometimes like we just need that guy, like the, somebody who stands on a chair at the right time and just like does something amazing uh, so that the rest of us can do something amazing. And what I loved about that video is like, he wasn't the star of the song. Like he wasn't the guy. Uh, he was just a guy um, sharing the song. And what I thought about that is like, that's a perfect, example of what, what we kind of need right now. We need somebody who's not going to seem like they're panicking. We need someone to sort of bring this together and say, look, it's going to be, it's going to be okay. So what if we had someone like that? Like what if we could be one like that ourselves? That's what I spent a lot of time thinking about because I believe that the world would be better if more people were what I call non-obvious thinkers, people who don't see the world the same way as everyone else. 
uh, people who can put the pieces together and kind of see what's different and, and, and sort of help others see that too. So what I wanted to do today is just talk to you about that. Like, what does it take to do that? What does it take to be a person like that? And I think the first step of that is just to see how the world is changing a little bit. And so I want to share with you three ways that I think the world is changing, give you some examples. Then I'm going to take you inside the process of what I typically use uh, to do this. And I'll give you a couple of trends and then we'll have a discussion and some Q&A and, and, uh, and just sort of uh, have have a conversation. Um, so that's the plan uh, for today. And the first piece of this was just like how we buy everything shifting. So like you can order a mattress and you can get it delivered at home. You can order these products that uh, decide how long to cook the food for you, right? So like you don't have to uh, even know anything about cooking, which is perfect for right now, right? Because a lot of us are forced to do more cooking maybe than we're used to. Uh, so the June intelligent oven, you just put the food inside and the cameras decide how long to cook it, right? Uh, restaurants, at least over here, are turning into what had been happening for maybe two years now as like ghost kitchens, which is this idea that like more restaurants will just be delivery. So they make the food and then uh, they just deliver it or you just go and pick it up. But there's no place to sit down uh, anymore. Uh, in San Francisco, they had an app uh, called Filled where you could order a fuel truck to your parked car and then you could get your, uh, your, your fuel filled um, in your car. So like all of these tools, all of these ways of buying, uh, everything from all of these to the subscription models that we see for various things, everything like that had already been shifting. And one of the things that I started uh, discovering as I started listening more and paying attention to more stories now is the shifts that are that are happening now may be accelerating, but the signs of them were already there before. And so that's what I'm starting to, to track and pay attention to. And that's one of the main tools of anybody who does futurist work, right? You pay attention to the signals of what's happening now to try and project what's going to happen more frequently in the future. Uh, the other thing was that technology both isolates us and it connects us. And you see that in many different ways. So here's a product out of Japan uh, that's a holographic wife. So you can actually, you know, get a subscription to this and it's companionship and there's like a hologram and it's like this whole thing, right? Uh, there's also uh, live concerts. So this is Now United, uh, which some of you might know. It's a, just this group of, of all of these, uh, mostly kids, you know, I call them kids because they're way younger than I am. Uh, from many different com uh, countries and they all come together in one group and they've been performing and it was sort of a reality show to find them. And now they're doing these from home concerts. Um, there's products like this, which is called the care coach, which is a digital avatar that had been around for elderly people to offer them companionship. And what's interesting about this is it was a avatar, but it was voiced by a real person. So you can interact with this as an animated image, but there's actually a human voice behind it. Uh, and you get to know that human voice and it's a service that they've been providing. So, um, so that was the second piece. And the third piece is what I call the uh, believability crisis. And this is the third big shift that I think is happening right now, which is we just don't know what to believe. Uh, we're unsure. And, and part of it is because we've just seen these messages that are unbelievable, right? So we see all of these beauty messages and we've seen them for a long time that don't really make us feel good about ourselves. I mean, here's a, here's a real one I saw from Levi's saying, hotness comes in all shapes and sizes. And then it shows you four women that are basically the same size. So like, what are you supposed to think after this, right? You don't feel good about yourself, you feel worse. And so you think, well, I, I need to go and get some stuff uh, to maybe make me feel better. Uh, these are products with with pitches, uh, marketing pitches that are completely unbelievable. I mean, all natural uh, cocoa crispies. It boosts your immunity. I mean, how are these things possible, right? There's no tree that grows this product. So how can it be all natural? It doesn't make any sense. But we see these stories and 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 we we kind of get used to dismissing them in our minds and thinking, well, that's not real. And it's hard because we just don't know. So I'm going to do a very quick poll here, right? So I'm going to share with you three headlines. And I want you to tell me, I want you to think actually for yourself, whether they're fake or whether they're real. Uh, and then I'll reveal the truth about them. So here's the first headline. Chemical in McDonald's fries could cure baldness. That's the first headline, okay? Just think for yourself, 
whether that's <laughs> real or fake. Bumblebee vomit. Scientists are no longer ignoring it. That's the second headline, okay? Third headline, sassy seal accidentally slaps man across the face with an octopus. Those are three headlines, okay? So this is the test for yourself of your media savvy, whether you can tell, are these real or are these fake, okay? Here we go. Here's the big reveal. First one, real. McDonald's fries could cure baldness. How? Because some researchers found a chemical that might regrow hair, and then another online writer Googles that chemical, sees what else has that chemical in it, finds that it's McDonald's fries, puts the pieces together and says, oh, McDonald's fries, cures baldness. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Uh, I tried it. Not <laughs> um, the second one is uh, bumblebee vomit. That's real too. Scientists are no longer ignoring it. Maybe there's curative properties in bumblebee vomit. We don't know. And the third one, unfortunately, I'm sorry to tell you, yes, this is real too. And you know you'll be Googling this video afterwards because it's really quite entertaining. I mean, it was the slap that was heard around New Zealand. But the, the problem with these stories and the problem with seeing headlines like this is they just erode our faith in knowing what's real and what isn't just a little bit more because like these ones happen to be real, but I could have picked fake stories and I could have put those in front of you and they seem equally believable uh, as well. And so what you're seeing is all of these books, uh, and these are just a couple of the covers of books that have been written recently that all point to the same idea. We don't know what's true. We don't know what to believe. Everyone's lying to us. We're in a post-truth society and we're surrounded. And the big question it raises is, well, how do we decide what to pay attention to? Like, how do we know? How do we figure it out? Uh, because this is a major challenge for all of us. And what doesn't work is paying attention to everything, like scrolling through all of the stories constantly and going through them one by one. Because the thing is like, no matter how good we think we get at being a speed reader, at consuming everything, right? Because, hey, the more we consume, like the more we can figure out, right? And if we use an app like this, maybe we can just like flash the words in front of our eyes much faster and therefore be better. But we're eventually gonna give ourselves a headache by trying to do that. Because like, you can't get smarter by trying to consume everything. We have this, this really disgusting habit here in the US uh, that, is, that is promoted through an event, a live event. Uh, and it, some of you might've seen this like in movies or on TV, or maybe you've even gone to the live event, but it's like a live uh, food eating contest where you eat as much as possible in as short a period of time as possible. And it's sponsored by this hot dog company. And if you imagine like trying to go and compete in this and eat like 50 hot dogs in a minute or whatever these guys managed to do to like to, to win, uh, you can imagine that you wouldn't feel very good afterwards. And it's kind of what's happening to us with information. We're spending so much time trying to consume everything that at the end of it, we feel like we just ate 50 hot dogs to, to try and win a competition we never wanted to be part of in the first place. And we have to get around that. We have to get past trying to do that. And, and my solution to, to getting past doing that is doing a little bit more of what Isaac Asimov called be a speed understander, not a speed reader, not trying to consume everything, but a speed understander, like someone who pays attention to what's important, who spends their time in more intentional ways. Now, I know that, that, all of you are probably already used to doing that. I mean, I did a little bit of digging. I, I watched a few videos with, uh, with uh, Ilma and I read up on your website. And I know you have your creative days where you spend time trying to do that, like trying to branch out, trying to do other things, trying to look at the world in different ways. And I think that's really important. I really love that. And it's mainly important because what I've seen, if there's a single truth that I've seen in all of these things, when you put all of the pieces together, you say, well, who wins? Like who consistently manages to do well and win? Uh, it's the people who understand people, the people who are able to understand what the motivations are behind other people uh, and then play to that. You see those people winning in politics. You see them winning in business. You see them winning in teams. Those are the people that win because they understand what other people around them need and they're able to deliver it. And that's partially by observation. 
but it also takes a couple of other things. And so I thought what I'd do is share with you the, the, the lessons that I've learned from 10 years of doing this, of paying attention to the details and trying to put the pieces together. And with the remaining time we have, I wanted to share with you what these mindsets are, and then also uh, share with you what the trends are that come out of them with some stories and some stealable, actionable ideas. So that's the agenda for us um, for the rest of the, the time that we've got together. And then we'll open it up to conversation and we'll have a, we'll have a chat about it. Uh, so the five habits, and by the way, I'm going to give you all of the slides afterwards. So um, I don't know if you're a screen grabber or, or whatever, but you don't have to. Uh, I'll give you the slides um, with all, all of these details afterwards. Uh, but the five habits that I've found are, are most transformative for any of us to be what I call a non-obvious thinker are to be observant, be curious, be elegant, be thoughtful, uh, and uh, be fickle. And the last one, be fickle, is, is the one that many people are most interested by. I mean, we kind of know what it's like to be observant. We know what being curious means to engage our curiosity. Being thoughtful just means to take time to think. Uh, be elegant is probably from my background being a, a, a English literature uh, student. That's what I studied back in back in school. Uh, and to me, and then I spent almost ten years working in advertising. And, and both of those really teach you about the power of elegant words, because in advertising you're choosing words very deliberately based on what you put out as ads. And in English, your your literature, you're doing the same thing. But be fickle was an interesting one. Um, and being fickle, sorry, let me reopen this. Okay, we're back. Um, being fickle was all about this idea that you can save an idea and move on. So you don't have to uh, use everything in the moment. You can save the idea and move on. And so let me share with you, when it comes to these five habits, like what does this look like for me? Because I've built these habits into a process. And the process allows me to put out this trend book. And every year I've put out a new version of the trend book. And I want to share with you what this looks like for me. So part of it is that I'm always looking at unusual sources. So these are just some of the unusual books that I have um, on, my, on my bookshelf. Uh, and you'll see that, uh, that they're not really the, the sorts of stuff that you would typically read. But when I read books, whether it's these books or more recent books, uh, I'm always saving interesting ideas by using these tabs. So this is the, what the process looks like for me. I'm using these tabs. And by using the tabs, I'm, I'm actually uh, allowing myself to save these interesting ideas for later. Um, I'm also often reading magazines. So a big part of my process is reading magazines, but not just any magazines. I'm reading magazines that are not things that I would be interested in. I'm reading magazines that are not for me. So I might read Teen Vogue magazine, which is now digital, but used to be in print. And that's a magazine for 16 year old girls, right? And I have two boys, I don't have any girls. So I have no reason to read Teen Vogue magazine, but when I do, I see stories that are about celebrities that I've never heard of. I see ads for products that I don't understand. I see language that maybe is unfamiliar to me. And by doing that, I give myself a chance to see someone else's world for a brief moment. And if you think about it, like we don't get many ways or chances to do that because what we consume, especially when we're working remotely, right? And I know most of you are, if not all of you are working remotely. And when you're doing that, you are seeing what you see online, which has been filtered already, right? And you're pretty savvy. Everybody on, the, on this uh, video chat is pretty savvy. So you already know that when you're Googling things, what you're seeing is based on what the algorithm knows about you. When you're seeing stories uh, suggested to you on social media, they're based on your profile. So what you're only seeing is like this piece of the world, not the whole world. And it's really hard to break out of that algorithm. It's really tough. And the only way that I've seen to do it is to intentionally go offline, to pick up a magazine. Because when I pick up the magazine from the newsstand, it's the same magazine that someone else got who's not like me at all. And by doing that, I give myself a chance to consume something that is not algorithmically delivered to me based on what it thinks I might be interested in. And that's a pretty big 
thing because we don't get as many chances to do that. So read magazines and, and more than that, read unfamiliar magazines because it gives you a chance to jump into another world and broaden your perspective, which is really, really important. As I'm reading all of these things and as I'm pulling all of this together, I'm curating these ideas. And this idea of curation is a big part of how I think about trends because curation to me uh, is the word that, that most of us know from museums, right? But it's the same principle. Like if you go to a museum, any museum, anywhere in the world, they don't take every piece of art they have and put it somewhere on the wall and fill the wall and say, here's everything, right? No museum does that. What do they do? They choose the most interesting pieces of art that tell a story and they tell you a story and they have exhibits. And by doing that, they're illustrating to you that there's a bigger picture. There's something else to be paying attention to. And I think if we could learn to do that ourselves with the information we consume to curate the, that information into bigger ideas for ourselves, we would get smarter we'd be able to deliver more value. We'd probably be able to, to be that guy on the chair, uh, maybe a little more often for the people that we're serving, whether it's the customers that we're working with or our colleagues that we're working with as well. So I've showed you a couple of visuals of what this process looks like for me, but I also wanna take you inside uh, what it looks like from a video perspective. And, and I wanna show you a time-lapse uh, video. And, and essentially what you're looking at here is a version of this whole process for me and what it looks like uh, every year when I'm curating these stories together. And what you're seeing here is lots of different articles from many different sources that are being pulled together based on the theme. So whatever the theme is, whatever uh, they, they fit together with, that's what's being pulled together. And once they're pulled together, um, they are elevated into a bigger idea. And in this case, the bigger idea is a trend that I call truthing. And what you're seeing is all of these come together into a trend that then eventually turns into a chapter that goes into this book. And so these trends, every year there's been 15 of these trends. And these are just a few of the trends that have come out from this report over the course of multiple years. And as I said, this has been a multi-year project for me. And so uh, over the last 10 years, since 2011, I've done a new version of this report every year. And every year there's 15 trends and the trends describe how the world is changing and what we should be paying attention to. And over that period of time, I've built up a large pool of readers who just read the report every year. In the first couple of years, it was an um, online report. Then it turned into a book, uh, which eventually hit the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. It then got translated into, I think, uh, 10 languages so far uh, and has been kind of all across the world. And last uh, January, so just a couple months ago, I did non-obvious megatrends, which is the final edition of the book. So it's the 10th year. It's the last time I'm doing it. And you might be wondering, well, why is it the last time? Like, why not keep, keep going? Uh, for me, it's been a, it's been a 10 year journey to get to this point. And it's a lot of work every year to rewrite the same book with different trends. Uh, and I wanted to move on. The first reason is because I just wanted to move on to doing something else. Uh, but the other reason was 2020 felt like this moment in time where it, was a good idea to just look back and see what had changed and move forward. And, and this was kind of before any of the pandemic stuff happened or we, we, we moved into this, this kind of strange reality that many people are faced with. Uh, but the lessons from paying attention to those signals and, and the trends, some of them, it's been really interesting how they've actually accelerated faster because of everything that's been happening with the disruption, with people being forced to move towards what already was going to be the future a little bit faster. And so I'm going to share a few of those. But I want to give you uh, a visual way of looking at this process that I thought was really interesting. It was uh, based on a photo shoot that a team of journalists did when they wrote a, a story about my curation method. Uh, and I teamed up with Microsoft and they wrote this story and they had this idea for a photo shoot. They said, we're going to bring to life this idea of you going through all this information to figure out what matters, but it's going to take some time to set up this photo shoot. 
Uh, and so we need you to be in on it. Uh, and I said, okay, I'm in. Uh, and so this is what we did. Now, this was the photo shoot. Um, this was not Photoshopped. This was me actually wearing all of these post-it notes. Uh, I did learn, by the way, in this process that there's something called an extra heavy duty post-it note that's designed for outdoor use, which is what these green ones are. So they're stickier than the usual post-it notes. Uh, just in case you ever need to wear a post-it note suit like this is that, you know, I have all sorts of insights on that. Um, but it was fun, but also interesting because what we were trying to demonstrate is that, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to pay attention to. And by the way, there I am holding uh, one of my favorite magazines, which is the Monocle magazine, which some of you might know, uh, which I find fascinating because it brings together interesting insights from across the world. And every year it's, it's, it's a pretty, uh, every month it's a pretty thick magazine. So it takes me a lot of time to, to get through it. Uh, but it's really great. It's really, it's really a good magazine. Uh, so this is what the visual process looks like. If you go to my Instagram account, you'll actually see a, uh, it's probably a little old now. It's a time-lapse video of this whole process of me getting covered in the post-it notes. So um, there is a way to see the backstory on that if you want to. Uh, but I promised you some trends. And so with the remainder of the time that, that we've got together, I want to share with you a couple of trends and then I'll open it up to questions and, and conversation. Uh, and one of the trends, uh, well, first of all, uh, definition uh, of a trend. So this is my definition of what is a trend. And to me, a trend is a non-obvious, uh, unique, curated observation of the accelerating present. And to me, the important part of this is the accelerating present, because I believe that the signals of what's going to matter in the future are already here, if we just get better at paying attention to them. And that's what I try and teach people how to do. So what are the things that happen right now that you might look at and say, oh, that's going to be really important. For, like, I need to pay attention to that. Or from a business perspective, we need to do something differently because of that, because of how people are reacting to this, because of what they're doing um, next. Is it going to change the way that they email? Is it going to change email marketing or, or marketing automation in general because of this behavior, because of this belief, right? And therefore, what are we going to do about it? That's the formation of how these pieces come together. So that's one of the things I want you to think about as I go through these trends. The other thing I'd like, love for you to think about is just, you know, what does this trend mean for me in terms of how I either relate to other people or that I will relate to other people moving forward? And that is particularly important when you think about the first trend that I wanted to share with you, which is something I call the human mode. Uh, and remember, these trends were written before this whole pandemic crisis, right? The human mode trend was about how when technology seemed like it was continually isolating us, we craved more human connection. Uh, we wanted more human ways to connect with one another and more human products and services. And we sought those out and we trusted those because they felt more authentic. And even in the midst of the crisis here, we're seeing more examples of that coming out. So before I would talk about the relaxed lane, which was this slow checkout line at the grocery store for people who might need a little extra time. So I'm not sure if this is happening wherever you're living, but uh, where I was living, uh, there were more and more automated checkouts. Uh, happening. So you wouldn't need to talk to anybody. You just go, you take your products, you check them out yourself and you leave. And there are some people for whom that just doesn't work. People who have Alzheimer's, people who have dementia, people who just need a little bit of extra time. And so many grocery stores in the UK started doing these relaxed checkout lines, which was this beautifully empathetic thing. And now it's shifted to stores opening a little bit earlier, at least around where, where I live, so that seniors have a chance to, to go and get their food and, and be socially distanced from everyone else and have more of a chance to, to do that. Um, and that's another example of, of kind of this human mode. The actor John Krasinski has been doing this uh, YouTube series, which has been hugely popular around good news. And he just shares interesting news to make people feel better. Uh, and he's kind of the star, the former star of The Office, and he's done a couple of other shows and uh, relatively well-known and a likable guy. And, and he's been putting out interesting good news. This is a Canadian band 
uh, named the Bare Naked Ladies, uh, which some of you may have heard uh, at some point. And they're doing these live jams from their homes and they're just all connecting and they're singing the songs that, that people know. And you're seeing musicians uh, all over the world doing things like this to try and just share uh, with one another, right? And it's, um, it's really interesting because when we see that, uh, we see how people are starting to connect uh, with one another. There was another great uh, example of a uh, Broadway music star who reached out to all of these students who did not have a chance to perform their high school musicals. And she said, look, if you perform on video, I'll watch, I'll be your audience. Which was this really nice way of, say, of valuing the hard work that people had done for these things that they weren't gonna get to do, especially, kids, which is really tough uh, for them because for us at least, like our entire, the rest of the school year basically got, got canceled. Uh, so my kids have been working from home uh, and, uh, and studying, uh, which is by the way, uh, one of the reasons I appreciate the early start time because like they're all sleeping. So it's perfect because I don't have to worry about dealing with any of that stuff. So I love your uh, timing of your global team. It really worked out well for me. Um, the lesson here, I think, behind the human mode trend is how do we take this idea, this made with empathy, and use it as, uh, as a strategy for us? So how do we do the things that we do with more empathy? Because that's what we're going to need right now. That's what we're all looking for a little bit more of. And if we can find ways to inject that into the ways that we interact with the people that we're interacting with, it can really make a difference. We can really stand out. Uh, we just have to have enough empathy to come up with it, right? To think of it, to think of how to do that. The second big mega trend that I wanted to share with you is something I called instant knowledge. Uh, and instant knowledge is the idea that we expect to be able to learn everything faster, faster than, than maybe ever before. And so you have stories like this eight-year-old who taught himself how to drive. I have way too much McDonald's in here. I guess I've been like thinking about American stuff perhaps a little bit too much. Um, but he drove to McDonald's and uh, when, the, when he got there, the staff there thought it was a joke. And when they realized it wasn't a joke, they called the police. The police came and interviewed this poor little eight-year-old. And he said that he was just hungry and he taught himself how to drive on YouTube. Like that's the world we live in where an eight year old teaches himself how to drive on YouTube and goes to McDonald's cause he wants a burger. Right. And what's that eight year old going to say after having lived through that, after having lived through homeschooling and, and, and distance learning and all of these things when he turns 18 and has that conversation about whether he should go to college, whether he should continue schooling, like what is that future going to look like? Right. Because on every level, we have the ability to learn these things almost instantly, right? The tasty cooking videos, which many of you have seen, help us answer what is an urgent question every single day, which is like, what's for dinner? And we go online and we watch these videos and they step through what the ingredients are and they help you figure out how to cook. And whether you know how to cook or whether you don't, like it doesn't matter because uh, this will show you how to do that, right? So we have access to that. This beautiful app called Radio Garden that works on your phone allows you to literally scroll through a world map and listen to a radio station from anywhere in the world. So now you can listen to news from a place that you don't live, which is something I highly recommend, by the way, especially for me, because I live in America and our news is, is very um, uh, one dimensional. And so I really have to be intentional about consuming news from other places. And I know what it's like because I used to, I lived in Australia for five years. I was born in India. I lived in the Philippines. I mean, I've lived other places where I've seen news cycles in other ways. And so I'm lucky, but a lot of times we don't have that because we live in the same place. We read the same stuff. And so we need things like this. We need things like Radio Garden to be able to help us break out of that. Uh, to do something a little bit different. Now, one of the upsides of the whole uh, pandemic is all of this amazing content that we might have otherwise had to pay for is now becoming free, at least for a short period of time. So we have access to some of the world's most amazing information. And it's really fascinating because now we can take all of that information and we can uh, turn it into knowledge for ourselves and for our kids uh, as well. 
I've spent a lot of time building a platform to enable us to take uh, advantage of this trend as well. So even before uh, the pandemic happened, one of the ways that I was shifting the brand, the overall brand of non-obvious is into these guides, which are meant to compete with the dummies guides. So the dummies guides and the idiots guides are written for, I think, uh, something that used to exist in the 90s, but doesn't so much exist right now, which is a large group of people that say, oh, I'm just a dummy. I don't know anything, you know, so I'm going to pick up a 400 page book. That's basically a definition of stuff. And if you pick up a dummies guide, I mean, what are they? They define the, like I picked up a dummies guide to digital marketing and there was three pages uh, defining what the internet is. I mean, seriously, like who needs that? That's it's stupid. And it's for stupidity. And instead of doing that, I thought, well, why not create a guide series with real experts that jump straight into what the insights are and helps people to really get stuff done and treats them like smart people. And so part of the tagline of these guides are smart advice for smart people. And on the flip side, it says that they're like having coffee with an expert. So that's the tagline, like having coffee with an expert. Because if you could do that, you would get much more value out of just that half an hour than you would out of reading a 400 page dummies guide that's useless. And that was the intent behind it. And what it allowed me to do with this brand of non-obvious is something that I think we all need to do now because of this trend, which is help people get smarter faster. Right? And you have lots of videos online. You have lots of content helping people get smarter and get better at promoting their businesses. Right? I mean, that's what you do. You help people to tell their story. You help them to get it out there and build their audience and give them the platform to do that. And the more you can help them get smarter about how to do that and not have technology be a barrier to allowing them to do it, the more loyalty you get from those people, right? Because you're all about simplicity. I know, right? I mean, it's in your name. So like, how do you deliver on that simplicity? Well, part of it is by helping people get smarter because the smarter they are, the more they're able to use the tools that you're putting in front of them So that they're not just sending blast emails that are super long, you know, they're using split testing, they're using the tools that are available to help them be better at at doing what they need to do. And that's super, super important. So how do we help people get smarter faster? That's the second big trend. Third trend is something I call revivalism. And revivalism is the idea that in a world where we're not sure where to trust and we have this believability crisis. Uh, so a uh, little background knowledge. I figured out how to do my uh, DSLR, but I have this auto shut off that I need to quite figure out. And I haven't quite figured that out. So it shuts off after a certain amount of time. So I got to re- return it on. So that's what's happening. So sorry about that. Uh, revivalism, the idea that uh, now more and more we're turning the clock backwards because we just don't know what to trust, right? And so what we end up doing is we end up trusting the things that we used to trust. And so we start listening to music on vinyl again. And Kodak is making film, like actual film, uh, for some diehard photographers. Uh, We have stories of of things that we remember from the past coming back, like Picard, which is this amazing show from this captain that I used to watch like 20 years ago that I loved. And and He-Man, which some of you may know and some of you may not, which I used to play with these action figures when I was a kid. And and it was terrible then. I don't even know why they're bringing it back, right? But they are bringing it back because we want these experiences from the past. And so we're going back to playing board games. Board games were having a resurgence. Uh, these classic video games are, are coming back as well. And, and what we're eventually figuring out from all of these is we're rediscovering the beauty of these things that had been happening in the past that we kind of moved away from and now came back to. We're rediscovering the analog. And this is kind of this macro thing that's been happening. And when you see this macro thing, you think, well, what is the analog for us? Like, what is the old school way that we might have done things in the past? And how do we reconnect with that? Or how do we make that something that our customers might reconnect with? Uh, That's really interesting to start thinking about how to do something like that. All right. And the last trend I want to share with you is purpose. Uh, and purposeful profit. And this is something that's been happening for for a long time now uh, in business. 
but uh, is going to continue to accelerate, especially now that we're looking at what are companies doing to make a difference in the world and to be helpful for people uh, and the cause related side of the business. So uh, everything from all of these beer manufacturers shifting to making hand sanitizer, uh, which is already happening to restaurants, uh, feeding people and, and changing their business model of how they feed people to Patagonia, which was a long time purpose driven retailer that said, look, don't buy our new stuff, save the old stuff, repair it, re, uh, reuse it, uh, resell it in some cases. And what all of these things point to is the idea of standing for something bigger, uh, standing for something that, that is um, bigger than a bigger message. And I know I promised you, you four uh, trends, but I thought I'd give you a bonus one uh, because we're having a good time. Um, and, and the bonus one that I want to share with you is something that I think is happening across the board in many different industries. And uh, one that I think we really do need to pay attention to. And it's what I call flux commerce. And flux commerce is kind of a two-sided thing. The first side is the idea that the way we pay for what we use is shifting. So we might use more subscriptions. We might change the business model around how we actually consume the information or the products or the services. And the other side of it is the lines that used to exist between two different industries are starting to blur. So you have coffee shops that are also banks. You have Apple opening up a, a credit card service. Uh, Taco Bell created a hotel. Uh, we already talked about the ghost kitchens, right? And, and Crayola uh, has a makeup line because makeup is basically painting your face, right? Uh, and all of this disruption, like what it's caused us to have to do is think about how are we going to do this intentionally for ourselves? Like how are we going to disrupt our business and how we work and change it to something that is going to work for us and allow us to be better prepared for the future, to allow us to be what Isaac Asimov called uh, a speed understander instead of a speed reader. And I believe this is really the big key. Like if we can be speed understanders, if we can be the ones that take all of these things that are out there, all of these stories, all of these uh, confusing uh, distractions and put those pieces together, curate them, into what we should be paying attention to and then share them with the people who are listening to us to help them get smarter, to help them do uh, better things. We can really put ourselves in a position of being uh, invaluable, of being experts, uh, of being that guy who stands on that chair and, and helps everybody else uh, to be better. And I think we can do that. I think that non-obvious thinkers do that. Uh, that's what the whole idea of non-obvious is about. Uh, and that's what I hope that some of these ideas allow you to do.